back to the ultraviolet tie. Today we were talking about all things Enneagram and I have a fantastic guest to help me do this. So Jackie, welcome to the podcast. Oh my goodness, Erica, thank you so much for having me on. I'm so excited for this conversation. You have no idea. <laughs> I am too. I'm excited this conversation gets to be recorded because even the second we hopped on the phone, we started geeking out about all of these things. So mm -hmm. we're going to bring the audience along with us as we talk about Enneagrams and personality types and yeah. all of that fun stuff. Um, but before we dive in, I'm going to give some brief background and then we're going to dive into all of the other fun stuff. Um, so Jackie Coban is a certified neurolinguistics practitioner, Enneagram expert, and life coach. She's also the founder of Table for Nine, a unique coaching program that focuses on Enneagram discovery and defining your unique personality type, which is so important. Her down-to-earth approach provides a safe space for each of the nine Enneagram types to take their place at the table whatever that means for them. So that means different things for different people. And as a female founder, finding your place at the table is super important to me. So we're going to dive into that. She is also an obsessive learner and avid question asker who firmly believes everyone's personality is dying to shine through. Now, Jackie, I know that is just a brief introduction. So I do want to turn it over to you to give a little bit more background um, on your story and table for nine. Oh my goodness. Yes. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, so I've been coaching with the Enneagram for about five years, but I've been studying it for about a decade. And um, to be honest, it is my favorite. People people ask me all the time, they're like, is this it? And I'm like, this is it for me. Like if, there, if this is not it, I'm like, I don't know what else there is. Um, I have loved the Enneagram for many years because it gave me language that I didn't know that I didn't have. And so as a person who's always been well-spoken, very mature, <laughs> labeled as by every adult. Um, it, it's crazy to realize that you can have the semantics for just about anything other than yourself. And mm -hmm. uh, when I got to that point, I was like, oh, well, I'm in deep yogurt if I can't really talk about myself. So I got to figure something out. And so falling into the Enneagram and using that as a basis for life coaching, using you as a basis for your growth, is just the mm -hmm. best thing I've found. So I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited to talk about it. And yeah, this is my favorite. <laughs> I love that you talk about, so self-discovery is such an interesting thing, right? Because like you said, you can have like the language of going through your profession or whatever, but in behavioral interviews, so when you're applying for a job and people ask you, tell you a little bit more about yourself. I know I'm not the only one who just freezes at that question from time Forgets to time. everything you know about yourself. Yes. Yeah. So having these tools in your back pocket so that you do know about yourself and you know how you operate, especially like if we want to talk about relationships too, like how do you handle conflict? How do you handle, you know, surprises or anything like that? It's so important to have this knowledge as you go through your life. So what I want to start talking about at the very beginning is the Enneagram test. And we were talking about this before we hit record. So I was telling you that for years and years, I was like, oh, I know I'm an Enneagram three. I have taken the Myers-Briggs. I know about myself. I know about myself. Yeah. I took the Enneagram test. I'm a one. I'm not a three. I'm a one. And you said you had a very similar experience when you took the test the first time as well. Yes, ma'am. So let me start by saying like the Enneagram test is available and there are there are tons that are excellent, but even the best tests are like 60 to 80% accurate because there's nobody across the table to look you dead in the eye and go, why? <laughs> like, right. Well, why? Right. So when I first took the online test, and by the way, one in three is like one, I got like, those are tethered together in women and I have to like rip them apart to figure out the the type. So don't, don't mm -hmm. fret not. Um, <laughs> but uh, when I first took the Enneagram test, my, my, I, I thought it was like the anagram test. I was like, yeah, whatever. This is cool. It's like, <laughs> it's like what uh, BuzzFeed's like, what pasta are you? I was like, yeah, cool. Yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, I took and I first typed as a six, uh, an Enneagram six. And I was like, okay, the loyalist, the guardian, like, I, okay. Like it didn't feel, it didn't feel right. I was like, someone could describe me this way and be right, but it doesn't, it's not me. And then I took the test again and I came out as type eight, the challenger. Now, if you look at my behavior on the outside, Yes, I 100% look like and act like the challenger, except that's not what it's about. So it felt really unsettling. And I was like, you know what, I'm just going to start doing my research. And then when I started doing my actual research, and the research is what helped me develop my typing questions for people, um, and I read the description for the type two, the giver, 
I did not touch the Enneagram for six months because I felt so exposed and so naked in a way that I, I, I like, you know, when you're reading something and you feel red in the face, but you're the only person in the room, nobody else knows what's on your mind, but you're just like, everybody knows. Everybody yeah. knows. That's what it was for me. Um, <laughs> and there was stuff on there that I was, I was like, I, I didn't even admit this to myself. How do you know? Like, right. You know I mean? right. So that was, that was a big one. Um, and that's, yes, that's why behavior, um, just doesn't compute. And that's why the online tests don't work because you need a person, you need a buddy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's yeah. so important. I mean, I have a friend who is super, super into Enneagrams and she's like, do you know what type you are? And I was kind of going through the test and everything, but, and she was like, but have you read the book? And she recommended a book for me to read. And she's like, it's so fascinating because you can think you're one thing or another, but until you start mm -hmm. to get in and actually read about it, because a test is super interesting, right? Because it asks behavioral questions. Mm -hmm. And immediately when you read it, a certain time or a certain situation pops into the mind where you yeah. might act in a certain way. So then you answer the question with that kind of reaction, but that yeah. might be only how you react 30% of the time, 40% of the time. Right. Um, so like you're saying, you got to dive a little bit deeper into it where on paper, you know, you kind of read the, maybe you read about the reformer and then you read like maybe three words that describe and you're like, Oh yeah, that sounds like me. Yeah. yeah. But it's just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. I mean, like I will say every day, like it's funny, I'm, I'm in a really cool season where I'm like redoing um, how I do my typing sessions with everybody. And it's so fun. It's so fun. But every day I'm telling my fiance, I'm like, babe, I'm definitely a different type. And he's like, read it to me because he's sick of my <laughs> he's sick of my crap. So I'm like, I'm definitely, I'm definitely this. And then I'll start reading and I'm like, never mind. Never mind. Yeah. Because, because it, like you, it, it's okay and it's healthy to see yourself in every type a little bit. And like, I think that's the pinnacle of growth is being able to say, I know where my motivations are. I know what needs managing in me throughout my life. At the same time, I've grown so I can be this, like, I, I don't have to be a one dimensional person anymore. Yes. So it's okay to see yourself in a lot of these different things. But to be honest with yourself about where your motivations lie is the, the, the most beautiful thing you could do for yourself, you know, because that's what the mm -hmm. Enneagram is based on. It's not based on your behaviors or what you do out loud, right? It's based on what mo – it's based on the why. Like, yep. you know, you and I – I have it on good authority that you and I would walk into a room and both be smiling, right? Like mm -hmm. smiling and warm and sunny, um, but we have very different reasons that we would do it. So it's kind of right. like that's really important. All right, we are back. Of course, audio, video, Wi-Fi, all fun things that you get to deal with when you're recording. Um, all right. So how I left you is talking about going into a room smiling for different reasons. And I'm sure the audience picked up on the rest of that. Um, but what I wanted to dive into, if you're okay with it, is a brief, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to go too deep into it, but a brief breakdown of the different types. So we don't have to do a yeah. deep dive into nine, but just like a little bit of a of an understanding of mm -hmm. what each of the nine types are. That sounds good. So you know what I'll do? I'll break it by center of intelligence. Um, okay. So there are three, there are nine types and three centers of intelligence, your brain, your gut, or your heart, or you can say like the mind center, the body center, or the heart center. Um, and so there are three types in each of the centers. The heart center is types two, three, and four. Two is called the helper or the giver. That's what I typed as. And they're warm and they love they love people. They love to help people. They love to give of themselves to people, but sometimes it's at their own detriment. And mm -hmm. we all have, for all of these types, there's an underlying why. So I won't get too much into it, but um, the type three is the achiever or the performer. And this type loves to outperform, outperform themselves, and they feel that their worth is in their works. And so that's what they strive to do. Enneagram type four is called the individualist. And sometimes people say the tortured artist, which I find really funny. And there's like a very <laughs> specific subtype that like enjoys being called the tortured artist. Um, and they do not like being called the John Mayer. So that's fine. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but they are, they're so creative. They're so, um, they have such a depth of capacity for different feelings, the goods, the bads, all of it. And they feel it throughout their lives and they're in the search for authenticity. Um, and then, so those are the three in the heart type, in the heart center, excuse me. And then we have the head center, which is five, six, and seven. So Enneagram five is called the observer or the theorist. I think the theorist is probably my favorite, um, my favorite nickname for them. 
uh, and they are 100% cerebral. They're a little bit detached from their emotions, but they are the type of people who focus on collecting knowledge throughout their lives so that they can be okay in the world. Um, Enneagram type six are, I think the, uh, the loyalist or the guardian, I like the guardian because there's a saying that they're kind of the guardian for the rules. Um, okay. I like to describe them as the type of people who live in code yellow all the time, but they are the people that protect us. Those are the people who ring the alarm because they love us. Um, and then there's Enneagram type seven, who's the enthusiast, who's like the Peter Pan of the Enneagram, who's just excited and excitable and is just always driven for more, always driven for what's next. So that's the head center. And then there's the body or the instinct center. So there's Enneagram eight. I think, I think the eight gets the worst rap on the Enneagram. Um, okay. And I don't know why. I love them. I love them. So, <laughs> But they are called the challenger or the contrarian. And they have this need to be or go against. And what that does for them is it helps them to not just appear strong, right? It's not about appearing strong. It's about specifically not appearing weak. And mm. that's very important for them. And then the Enneagram uh, nine is called the peacemaker or the referee. I, I find that the peacemaker is probably the most fitting. Um, okay. And they are focused on avoiding conflict. And so what they do is they, they meld and they flow with other people. They are like literally the sweethearts of all of the types. Um, but they like to avoid conflict and they like to see about life that way. And then there's type one, there's the, <laughs> the reformer or the perfectionist. And that's the one type that I actually see a 50-50 split in the nickname where, you know, I'm like, you know, help, helper or giver, challenger or contrarian. But for the, for the type one, I actually see like a 50-50 split and it depends on the subtypes. Um, mm -hmm. So either the perfectionist or the reformer, but they're really, really principled and ethical and they just want to do the right thing and be the right thing and model the right thing. Um, and I, I want to actually disclaim this about the ones because this is like my biggest gripe recently is a lot of people believe that like the core fear for the one is being bad or being evil. And while mm. there is some underlying truth to it, the reality is that the core fear of the one is that they're immutable, that they're not going to be able to change. Or they're not going to be able to go grow or unless they control it or they can control their environment. So mm -hmm. getting into the, I say that to say, getting into the nuances of each type is super important. Last thing I will say is if you notice there was a number sandwiched between each of the centers of intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. So the three, the six, and the nine. Um, because they're in the middle of their center, so three is in the heart center, but it's right in the, in the middle between two and four and six and nine are the same, they'll actually repress their own center. So threes are in the heart center, but least connected to their hearts. Sixes are in the mm -hmm. mind center, but least connected to their minds. And nines are in the body center, but least connected to their bodies. So mm -hmm. that's the briefest overview I could possibly give you. I'm sweating. <laughs> That was the perfect way to sum that up because I feel like, you know, bringing them together in groups like that makes it a lot more digestible to understand how yeah. there are differences, but there really aren't at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it They're makes little it nuanced things. Yeah, totally, totally. And when you break it down that way, it makes it so clear why you need all forms together in a society in order to function. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, I think that's that's the main thing. People ask me, the table for nine, like, do you have nine kids? Like people tend to, <laughs> to ask me that. And I'm like, okay. no, my whole thing is when I started working with the Enneagram, people were like, oh, like I like all the types, but like, I just can't be with a five. I love all the types. But, like mm -hmm. I just, uh, I'll never date a seven. Like I, and I was just like, yo, it doesn't work <laughs> like that. Like, you don't, you don't, you, I, like if you're choosing who right. you get to have at your table, you're not the healthiest version of yourself, babe. Sorry. Like, right. and I remember just thinking to myself, if I'm the healthiest version of me, I got no problem with nine types around my table. I don't care who you are. Right. I care who I am. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. I know. And I think that's such a great way to put it. And it is something that once you dive a little bit deeper into it, you know, my husband and I both really did a deep dive and we're like, oh, that's why we butt heads on that. Or that's why yeah. we have an understanding of this other thing. And it's super fascinating. Yeah. So, you know, just knowing that in your personal relationship, but also knowing that in a workforce. So how can people mm. use this knowledge to help them navigate the world, what, whether, whether it be like hardship or happy things, or, mm -hmm. you know, how can people utilize that to really understand how they go through life? Ooh, so I, I don't think this answer is going to be hot. Like, I don't think anyone's going to really like it, but I have to be, mm -hmm. I have to be honest or I'd be doing a disservice. So whether it's work, whether it's life, love, hardship, grief, um, dealing with a situation that just has not ceased, right? Like 
whatever it is in your life, the Enneagram's for you. And the reason I say that is because when I've spoken or met with people and they hear about it, the first thing they do is they want it for their kids. They want it for their relationship. They want to give it to their manager. Mm -hmm. They want to give it to somebody else who is hurting or misunderstanding them. And the truth is the Enneagram is only for you. Mm -hmm. And Erica, the Enneagram is only also for your husband, but Mm -hmm. it's very individualistic. And so I say that to say the way that the Enneagram helps is number one, that we understand this is an extension of that principle that we only have control over ourselves and what we do Mm -hmm. and how we react and how we see the world. And if we're not okay with that at first, we may need you to do a little like self-work before looking into the Enneagram. Right. But if we can get to that place, then what the Enneagram can do for us is wherever we allow it to, it can shine a light on our why. Mm. And when you work with a coach or you work even within yourself, you're able to see how that why shines onto everything. Now it can shine onto how you work. Um, I'll give you an example. I have one client who was a seven, is a seven, excuse me. And, um, you know, they had their standard moving from one thing to the next because they were so excited, right? Mm -hmm. But one of the other nuanced things was they were moving on from one thing to the next very quickly and on their own accord so that they didn't have to see the ending of the last thing. They could choose to move on from it and not see the ending of it. And so it's like, if I had given that to their manager, if I had given that uh, to their fiance, if I had given that to anybody in their life, they they may have their relationship issues solved, but they're still always going to be doing that thing. And so- the the thing that the Enneagram shines the light on is wherever your why is, as long as you're ready for that. Uh, and the best example that I can give of that is that like my fiance, even though he's recently been like, okay, I'm ready. I haven't typed him yet and I'm going to marry him. And it's not difficult to love someone who doesn't know their Enneagram type. It's not difficult to make a relationship right. work with someone who doesn't use the Enneagram. I'm proof of that, right? I'm excited that he wants to do that and he's ready to do it on his own terms. Um, but the Enneagram is helpful in our relationship because I use it for myself. Mm-hmm. Right, right. And I think that's so important too, because it goes back to the whole self-discovery of when you're in a job interview, are you able to talk about yourself? How yeah. well do you know yourself? And it's okay if, I mean, I know when I was first like doing research and I was reading about table one and I was I was feeling that sensation that you were talking about, of just basically kind of feeling a little called out. And you're like, oh, 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 I guess I do that. Oh, man, I definitely do that. And it's like, it takes a little bit of time to like process and understand and then use that information to maybe change how you see the world or change how you do things. Um, It's got to stop feeling a little ugly first. You know, it feels a little ugly when you first hear it because you're like, stop calling me out. (laughs) Right, right. It's super interesting. But I think it also is great for learning your own personal motivators. Um, Mm -hmm. That was super important to me that you know, because it's always striving to like do things and be seen a certain way. And we don't have to dive too deep into, <laughs> into my type <laughs> one personality. But it's, it's knowing those things so that you can recognize them. And then mm-hmm. you can perform even better than you did before, because you're ready to go, you you know, things yeah. and you're, you're, you're deciding then to be a student of it. Yeah, I mean, it's like, um, you know, I, I hate to use this example, um, but apparently nobody outside of like the tri-state area on the East Coast knows what rumble strips are. So I have to use a different example. <laughs> but uh, we all know the symptoms of what it means when we're about to throw up, right? Back mm-hmm. of your mouth starts watering. You start to maybe feel a little fun. Like, you know when it's coming. And mm-hmm. essentially, the Enneagram does that same thing. Like the Enneagram, like you don't know what you don't know, but once you know it, you can't unknow it. And so when metaphorically, you're behaving in life and the back of your mouth, quote unquote, starts watering and you go, something's not right. Like, this doesn't sound like me. This doesn't feel like me. Or why did I do that? Because I have a lot of those moments and I cho- I have to choose to not feel shame, but I don't get to choose when that flashlight comes on anymore, where it mm-hmm. like shines on me and goes, hey, like that, that was a little bit manipulative. You know, that was a little mm-hmm. bit manipulative because you were scared and I have to be like, oh, yeah. oh, oh my God. Like I, you know, and it's okay that it, it's not intentional, but it's really important that I notice. It's really important that we notice. So it's kind of like the, what the Enneagram does. I'll, I'll give the other <laughs> the other example just in case it's not as disgusting, but it's like rumble <laughs> strips on the side of the highway, mm-hmm. which a lot of people didn't know when I talked about it previously. But um, essentially, if you're veering off, you have rumble strips on the side of the highway that essentially jolt you or wake you up. And that's really what the Enneagram does. It's something that goes, uh, this thing is not right. You know when you do this thing, when you act this way, when you feel this way, when you start reacting like this that something is not right. Mm -hmm. And it gives you a little bit of that. You got to wake up. Right. 
Mm -hmm. I wanted to also talk a little bit about, so I don't know what your opinion is on Myers-Briggs, but I think before the Enneagram, that was the biggest personality test that people were using. So what is your perspective on it? And I mean, yeah, let's just start there. Yeah, I I think it's a really useful tool. I think it's a really useful tool for uh, observable behaviors, which is why I think it goes hand in hand and does different things in the Enneagram because um, so Myers-Briggs, like I'm an ENFJ, for example, and I remember reading that and not necessarily feeling exposed, not feeling, but feeling like I could say it to people and they'd know how to like talk to me and Mm -hmm. how like they like how to receive me. Mm -hmm. And that was it. That was kind of like it gave me a little bit of permission in a sense or like almost like a name tag, like, hello, I'm ENFJ. Like that's what it was. Right. The Enneagram was something that I I wanted to keep it private, to be honest, when I learned about those things, because they feel so specific to your struggles, quote unquote. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I say they do different things. They're for different purposes. I think that the, the, I think Myers-Briggs is excellent for, um, you know, coming face to face with people and talking to people about, you know, like, to, to go based, based on the example that I was using before of like saying, you know, the Enneagram is just for you. Myers-Briggs uh, is really for you and others, but the Enneagram's for you. Interesting. So that you can live your life as yourself, whatever the hell that looks like. Yeah. That's a great differentiator because I always feel like it's it's never a bad thing to have more information about yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, so I always feel like they could work in conjunction perfectly. I feel like sometimes Myers-Briggs is just a little bit more in depth in a way that you're like, oh my God, I really have to do a deep dive in order to understand that. Whereas I feel like with an Enneagram, you take the test and then you kind of do the deep dive after. Um, Mm. So you have to start doing the work after where I feel like the Myers-Briggs, you answer it, you get the answer and you're like, oh yeah, 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 that makes sense. And then the Enneagram is a little bit more of like a, ooh. Well, you got to do something about this now. Like, yeah. Yeah. You're not just, yeah, you're not just an extrovert. Take it and run. It's right. Yeah. Right. It's not like one of those things where it's like, oh, I'm an introvert, so I have to work on being more extroverted. No, you're an introvert and that's okay. That's how you perceive the world. And so I see it kind of different from that way. And that is maybe how it can be used beautifully together. Um, But okay, so let's talk about some common misconceptions (gasps) when it comes to Enneagrams. What have you heard that you're just like, oh my gosh, that is totally a myth. Okay, cool. Uh, Let's start with one uh, that the Enneagram is demonic. Oh God. Okay. <laughs> I have to, I'm sorry. I have to start with it because I've had people who don't conform to spiritual practice who are, mm-hmm. and they are like, I heard it's demonic. I'm like, Oh goodness. All okay. right. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Like, so essentially it's not, um, it's a very, very ancient tradition. And so I'm, I'm of Middle Eastern descent and this started in the Middle East as well. And so one of the things that I know is People talk about people based on their motivations from the Middle East. That's what they do. Um, and it's it's a tradition of oral storytelling about mm-hmm. people. And so when you put anything down to paper, the first person who takes it and coins it, if they have a spiritual practice or are a religious person of sorts, uh, I think that's the first thing that people think about. Um, if you like it, find somebody who uses a human-based or psychology-based or just neutral perspective of it just because it's really important for you to learn yourself. And then you take it and you make Mm -hmm. whatever you want out of it. So there are people who spiritually practice the Enneagram. There are uh, Christian practitioners in the Enneagram. There are Jewish and Muslim practitioners. You take it and you make it yours, but start with a blank slate. So that's like the the first Mm -hmm. misconception I want to say is like, it's it's just a neutral, it's a neutral tool. That's all. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Um, another misconception is that you can be multiple types and you can definitely align yourself, see yourself with multiple types, but you have one and it doesn't change over time. I actually think that's a huge difference with Myers-Briggs because a lot of the research shows that your preferences can change over time, over long periods of time Mm -hmm. for Myers-Briggs, but with the Enneagram, it doesn't. So I know as a two, like as an Enneagram two, the giver, my motivations are either managed or not managed. And I'll know based on my behavior. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. And I'll be having to manage this stuff for the rest of my life because that's what I'm predisposed to. The same way like someone who's a challenger or someone who may be an an angry person is going to have to deal with their anger for the rest of their lives, but that doesn't mean they can't manage it. Right. right? And so it's like we all have our predisposed struggle. We can choose Mm -hmm. to manage it or not. So I think that's the the other preconceived thing is that um, we can change our types over time. We don't. Mm -hmm. Um, what else? Hmm. 
people talk about the concept of wings. Um, I was just about to ask about wings and what it is. I don't know what it is. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm happy to explain because I think that's another okay. misconception. So sometimes okay. people will take an online test, right? Let's say they type as an eight, but maybe their runner up was a one. Okay. And they'll say, I'm an eight with a one wing. Okay. And that's not the case. That's just, okay, based on your score, how they compiled it, that's your runner up. So essentially your wing, if you think about a bird, it's the the wings are the two things next to the body. And so mm-hmm. I'm a two. My wings are either one or three. Mm-hmm. They can't be eight, seven, six, five, four, mm-hmm. whatever. So right. they're, uh, for you as a one, they're either nine or two okay. or both, right? And so you can have one dominant wing. So I can heavily lean on my one wing. And all that means is I borrow inspiration from it. So I'm a two. My motivation is to give of myself and to help others and to be loved and to be needed. Mm -hmm. I might do it like a perfectionist. Or if I see something wrong, I, I might really need to fix it. And that's just me borrowing inspiration from my one wing. Or I might be in the middle of work and someone tries to show me up and I'm like, you're going down. And that's my three wing. <laughs> but that doesn't mean I've changed my motivations as a person because I don't identify with the motivations of like the one or the three at their core. Mm-hmm. But some of the behaviors are not, um, they're not foreign to me. And so that's what with the wing. And so like to give you an example based on you, like you may notice peacemaking tendencies from time to time. You might also notice that your desire to help people through perfecting or reforming might shine through because you're two wings. So it's like, mm-hmm. it's, it's really being able to borrow. And it's, I, I go back to what I said before, we're not meant to be one dimensional. We're meant to see ourselves in everything right. and everyone. Right. Yeah. That's, so a that's great what wings are. It. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love that. And do you normally recommend people like dive into the core before they start like exploring the wings yeah. just for yeah. a thorough understanding? Yeah. So if, if, when I meet with people who, when I do a typing session, if they're familiar with the Enneagram and they just want to know which one's their type, we'll go into the wings, we'll go into the subtypes. But if, if we're starting from scratch, we'll just go into the type because that alone can take up to like 90 minutes to just go over the nuance. Like, cause you really want to find where you fit, um, in the type. Like I don't, I don't fit the typical helper stereotype, but I fit the giver stereotype like to a T. Like mm-hmm. I'm br- probably, I'm probably not going to help, but mm-hmm. I'm going to give of myself till the last drop's gone. And that's, you know, I have to work on that. Right. But, mm-hmm. um, we have to find where we fit within the type. And so we want to like, is this us? And where do I see myself before I go? Okay. Well, how do I act on the day to day? Cause right. that stuff matters the least, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. And if people are listening and they're like, okay, well, I want to read a book or I want to take a test or I want to do this, Mm -hmm. where do they start? Because it's hard to know because there are so many resources out there and it's hard to know which ones are the best to start with. Yeah, no, I I agree. And so it's hard for me to point to an online test. Um, I'd say your Enneagram coach, um, she is, I believe, a Christian practitioner, but I believe her test is like of neutral language. Um, And so it's a very, very thorough test. And I really, really like that one um, if you're going to take an online test. And then a book to read would be The Wisdom of the Enneagram. I think that's one of the best books out there. Um, My best advice would be don't just stop when you feel like you've hit your type. Read all the Mm. way through. Read all the way through because you might be wrong. (laughs) Right. Right. That's great Um, advice. Yeah. That's awesome. And we'll include that in the show notes as well, because I know, you know, being able to easily find those resources and Mm -hmm. a whole, I don't want to say like a whole mess of resources, but there are a lot of resources out there and you'll go through the test and they'll say, okay, now pay $9.99 for your test results. And you're like, what the heck? I just wanted to know. No, that's it. And no. And so like, I will tell you, like, I, I do type people. I, people pay me to like type them and that's what we do in our sessions. Right. Um, it's so different. Like I, I was on a podcast once and I, I felt so flattered to hear this come out of the host's mouth, but he was like, you know, like I've talked to her a lot and a test comes in second. And that to me, I was like, that makes the most sense. Like a test comes, always comes in second, the same way a reading a book on mm-hmm. self-help, reading the mountain is you comes in second to sit in your butt in therapy. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So right. it's kind of like, it's like, yeah, it'll do it for you. And I hope that it does. Um, but it doesn't even have to be me, but I would encourage anyone who really feels like they could use this for them to find a or any practitioner and meet with them even just once. 
um, so that they can see themselves in the type. Because mm -hmm. it, if you do it alone and you go at it alone, it, it's kind of like Myers-Briggs in that you take the information and you just know it about yourself and you can call it a day. You can't unknow mm -hmm. it, but what are you going to do with it, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's one of those things that I can confidently say, uh, you must do it by yourself, but you can't do it alone. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. Mm -hmm. And I think too, yeah. to your point about saying like, well, you have the information, but what are you going to do with it? Yeah. And, you know, working with someone to help you figure out what to do with it is really where the value comes into play. Yeah. Because the truth is when I meet with somebody and they're like, oh, my goals are, you know, I'll never forget this. I'll give this example. Um, my first client ever. Um, she said, I, I said, why are you meeting with a life coach? And she said, I don't have friends and I need to learn how to make friends. I said, okay, yeah, that's a great goal. It's a great goal. She typed as an Enneagram six. Hmm. And I remember thinking, we need to figure out why she has not made friends when she's a community built person, mm -hmm. right? Like sixes have community built in their, in their lungs for God's sake, you know? So, hmm. um, after we, after I typed her, her goals changed. Like I didn't work with her on making friends, but by the time we were done working together, she had a whole community of friends. Mm -hmm. We worked on all of the stuff in between. And so the, the fun, the fun tool of the trade, the trick of the trade is people, uh, the people I work with, they meet their own goals that they set, but the Enneagram helps them figure out what are the real goals that I actually need to get out of the way before, mm -hmm. like, what is the headache a symptom of something bigger? And right. usually it is. Right. That's a fantastic mm -hmm. way to put it. And I know people are listening and they're going to want to connect with you. They're going to want to learn more. Um, so if they want to do that, where can they find you on Instagram, your website, all of the above? Yeah. So uh, on Instagram, I'm at table for nine coaching. It's F-O-R and the number nine. Uh, I love DMs. It just takes me a little while to get back, but I love DMs. So you can DM me anytime. Um, and my website is table for nine coaching.com spelled the same. So you can find mm -hmm. me, hang with me, um, anything like that. Awesome. And we'll include all that in the show notes in addition to those resources for everyone who wants to learn more. But Jackie, thank you so much for your time and for geeking out with me over this conversation. Oh, thank you so much for having me and for uh, for even talking to me about like your own journey with the Enneagram. That was such a delight. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me on.